talk about geothermal energy, but a particular type of geothermal energy. Now, most of the time when you mention geothermal energy to anyone, automatic pictures come up of volcanoes, boiling mud, geysers, Rotorua, Iceland. This sort of picture you can see here, well, it's got nothing to do with this. Others think about hot rocks, as it's sometimes called. And this is basically when you drill deep holes down into the ground, four and a half kilometres or so, five kilometres, and you fracture the rock, or frack it is the word they come around these days, and this causes this to be permeable. You then force water down here to come up production wells, and since this is about 200 odd degrees down there, what you get is a mixture of steam and water coming up here that can then drive turbines. Now this is a technology that hasn't become commercial yet, I'm sure it will do in about 10 to 15 years, but just at the moment it's not. And part of the reason is you can see the sort of equipment that's needed to drill down there, or 40 or 50 million dollars worth to drill a hole. And the holes cost about 20 million dollars down to about 5 metres. But it will become an important technology in due course. But it's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> Hot and warm water, you're all familiar with those wonderful things you go to, the springs. Dalesford over here, I don't think many of us were around here in Roman days with Bath and all the rest of it, but hot springs, water comes up around 40 degrees and we wander around in that and feel great when we've come out. Once again, I've got nothing to do with that at all. So what are we talking about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is direct geothermal or direct use geothermal. And essentially what it's doing is making use of the ground at its normal temperature and nothing else. In Melbourne, our ground temperature below about 2 or 3 metres is about 18 degrees. And that is the temperature of the air, the average temperature of the air, all year round. Not surprising. If you go down to Hobart, we've got a ground temperature of around 15 degrees. Up to Sydney, 20. Brisbane, 22. Darwin gets a little higher, 27, 28. And so what we're using is this ground down here. There are three elements to this. There are the ground loops. This is where we run water through the ground. There are other fluids used, but there's no need to use anything else other than water. We've got what we call a ground source heat pump, and we've got the building that's got the demand for heating or cooling. Essentially what we do then is that we pass water down through pipes in the ground. I'll show you some of these pipes a little later. And what we might have, for instance, we might have water going down here at, say, 12 degrees. This will pick up heat from the 18 degree outside, and this might get up to about 14 or 15 degrees by the time it gets back up here. Typically, the depths we go to are somewhere between about one and a half metres down to 50 or 100 metres. No need to go any further than that. What happens when we get up to this heat pump is this heat pump, which I'll talk about in a moment, takes heat out of this 15 degree water, say. It could be less, it could be more. And that heat then is delivered to the building as hot air or water. The cooled air water goes back down here to heat up. Now if you want more heat up, that means you've got to send water down at a cooler temperature, which means you get more heat coming across. And so you work your way through that. Okay, now there's a few wonderful things about this. First of all, uh, one of the great things is, is that this system basically uh, pulls heat out of this ground and we have things called coefficients of performance. And what it basically means, in very round figures, that for every dollar you spend on electricity to run your heat pump up there, because it needs something to run it, you're getting about four times that energy out for heating and cooling. Which means then you're getting this energy for something like a quarter of the price. So you can start to see the importance. Even more important is that here, for each four kilowatts of heating and cooling, we're only spending one money on one kilowatt, which means you've reduced your carbon footprint by a factor of sort of four or thereabouts. So you can see the importance. And of course, what we've got in the summer, when we've got a hot house, all we do is we switch it the other way around. So what we do now is we take the hot air out of the house, we go from the heat pump, the heat pump then dumps that hot air into this water, so that water will now go into the ground, 24, 25 degrees, because it's going into 18 degree water uh, ground in Melbourne, this will then dump heat out and this will come up at maybe 22 degrees or thereabouts and ready to pick up more heat. Once again, we're doing it at a massive reduction in our carbon footprint and we're doing it at a factor of the uh, very small fraction of the cost it takes to run traditional heating and cooling sources. 
Now just note that the borehole diameter is not to scale. There's really only about 120 millimeters you need. That thing is drawn to about two meters diameter. Some people see that and go, oh my god, I can't have holes that big. However, okay. So that's basically what it is. And you can see it consists of three parts. There's the ground loop system, the heat pump, and the building that causes the demand. Ground loops, yeah, putting the ground loops in. This is actually two weeks ago. This is the Walter Boas building here, which is on the corner of Monash Road, I think it is, and Wilson Avenue Road. There's Wilson Hall, and we've been drilling holes, you can see in here, and that's us putting 50 meters of pipe in the ground. They're HDP pipes, they're double loops with a pipe in the middle for the grouting, and you can see they are lead by example, so it's a wonderful way to spend a Saturday and Sunday. A bit messy, you can see that, but these are going in the ground and these are all instrumented, and there's five of these holes. The Walter Bowers ground floor will have geothermal energy heating and cooling fairly soon. Of course, that's going vertically, and it does get quite expensive. Sometimes if you've got the space, it's a lot better to do it horizontally, if you've got the space. It's not as efficient because up here at two meters deep where this hole is, you would get the ground, it will vary in temperature a bit. So in Melbourne, this is actually in Main Ridge down at Red Hill on the peninsula, um, it's a little bit cooler, but it's a little bit of variation between about maybe 13 and 17 degrees down in that part. So it's not as efficient, but it's a lot cheaper to make a big hole in the ground and to put a lot more of this pipe in here. Drilling is very expensive. This is a large uh, house, it requires, it's about uh, ooh, eight times the size of your average house. Um, and this is what is known as a slinky system, and fairly obvious where the name comes from. And so these are a set of loops that we've set up here as part of our observations and a test field uh, that we've got running down there. Everything is now starting to run through. We've now got wireless connections to all the instruments, and all the instruments you can see are all buried in and around to work out and understand how these things are working. Okay, therefore, domestic style things. When you're going into the ground with foundations, make use of the holes you're digging in the ground. This appeals to me, and that's how I got into it. I'm a geotechnical engineer, and I suppose I spent 30 years designing these things. This is the reinforcing cage for a large board pile, probably about ooh, two meters, no, a meter and a half diameter. This will go down the borehole, and concrete will then be poured. So if you've got a hole in the ground, why don't you put some pipes in there as well? And so you're putting these pipes in for very little. These are vertical holes, um, and just as you have vertical ones, you can have horizontal ones in large commercial foundations. This is a uh, underground station in Vienna. This is where the platform will be. This is where the train will be. Why not put all this piping in there, cover it with concrete for the platform, and use this heating and cooling source for buildings above? Europeans are getting even cleverer. If you're under the ground with a tunnel, why not put some pipes in the tunnels? So here we have a tunnel, this is the tunnel line, and you get lining around like this, just a synthetic material with the uh, various loops pinned to the side before shot creek gets sprayed on. Or you can make it in the precast tunnel liners where you've got pipes running through it and made in precast units. And in Germany and Austria, these are being used quite a lot just recently. Of course, it's not just a question of heating and cooling for people. There are so many other things you can do with heating and cooling processes. Some listed down here, and you can see quite obviously where they apply. In Korea, they've now got hectare upon hectare of greenhouses which are being geothermally heated and cooling. And they are producing massive quantities of vegetables uh, long before the period for growing normally would be. Now, heat pumps. I won't go into the detail, but a heat pump is basically something, a machine, that moves heat from one point to another point. It's like a water pump, it goes from uphill, it pumps from down there to up there, and this is essentially what happens. The water, when it comes in from the ground, it comes to a heat exchanger. Inside the heat pump there will be a refrigerant. This refrigerant will then evaporate because it boils at these low temperatures. It then goes to a compressor where the gaseous uh, refrigerant is compressed. This then increases temperature enormously, so something like 70 or 80 degrees. This is air coming in from the house. It heats up, goes off to the house nice and hot. The heat taken out of that then returns this to a liquid. Then it comes around to an expansion valve and so on and so on. Most people aren't terribly familiar with heat pumps, um, but a very common one you'll see is essentially the fridge, the common garden fridge. 
Some of the comments you have is thinking, goodness, a little thing like, you know, not much heat in a, in a fridge, it's that big. Well, that's the food cupboard is that big thing. The heat pump's the little thing usually at the back where the drawer's got a little curve in the back of it. That's the heat pump there. And that basically takes heat out of your food cupboard and takes it around to the coil at the back. And so that's how it's used. So everybody should be familiar with them. Okay, some of the heat pumps. These are a couple of uh, seven kilowatt heat pumps. Uh, that would be enough for most average houses. This is a bank, oh, I think these are 25 kilowatt heat pumps, and this is for a, a moderate sized building, probably something about ooh, uh, 10 times the size of an average house. And then of course you can move on to the serious heat pumps, which are these things like this. This setup here provides something like 6 megawatts heating and cooling for a university in Korea, which I'll show you in a moment. So that's what the heat pumps look like. And of course the final and one of the most important uh, elements of course is the demand that the house is producing. So the building heating and cooling demand has a number of variables. Clearly the climate. The hotter it is outside, the more cooling you need. The colder it is outside, the more heating you need and so on. And of course as you know this depends enormously on the construction, how well it's insulated. The effect of sun and shade is incredibly important. Ventilation lights and appliances really does start chucking the heat out. People, building use, distribution system. It's quite interesting that a lot of the office buildings in uh, Scandinavia are net coolers. They need cooling, more cooling than heating. I was down at one of the uh, computer terminals um, a few months ago, just down in Bouverie Street, there's a big terminal down there, and I learnt that almost a third of the university's electricity is used for cooling computers. And that's absolutely amazing. Amazing heat gets generated. Okay, what are the advantages of it? Well essentially it's a sustainable and renewable energy source. One of the greatest things is it's available 24-7. Not when the sun shines, not when the wind blows. It's there all the time. It provides a major reduction in the electricity you require, or the gas, or whatever you need. And of course it provides a major reduction in carbon footprint. It's a well-established technology around the rest of the world. It's about three million installations in Europe and America and rapidly growing in China, Korea and Japan. Well, you might ask, well, why are we doing any work in this? Well, the reason is that I was absolutely staggered a few years ago when I got involved in this, that there's a lot known about the buildings, there's a lot known about the heat pumps, but the ground was quite unbelievable in that no one really knew what was happening. I had a look at the various standards and they were saying, oh, you'll get something like 60 watts for every metre of borehole. Oh, okay, well, what happens if you make the borehole bigger? What happens if you move to a different geological formation? What happens if you use two pipes, four pipes? What happens about the size of the pipes? What happens if you have different fluids in there? What happens, what happens, what happens? The answer, oh, about 60 watts a metre. We know that's nonsense because we're getting an enormous amount more than that. And, of course, if you get more energy out of the ground, you can cut down your capital cost of putting your boreholes in the ground in the first place. Of course, it's fair to say there's a number of disadvantages, and those disadvantages are it's largely overlooked in Australia so far, which we're trying to change. Few people have actually heard of it. Costs at present are a little high in Australia, simply because industry hasn't really got geared up to it, it's still people are not used to it, and every time you ask for a price, you'll get, mm, we'll have a bit of a risk factor in here in case a few things go wrong. So there's not a lot of confidence yet, but it will come. So we believe that as industry matures, as competition develops, as carbon tax bite, and that will happen, and if and when subsidies are introduced, that will mean it starts to become very competitive. I thought I'd just run through a few examples, and there's plenty around. A house in Surrey Hills, there is a 4.7 kilowatt heat pump, 14.7, sorry, kilowatt heat pump, and that's done with four 30 metre boreholes in the front yard. This is the Bee Rush Ski Club at Mount Hotham, that's been there for about seven or eight years now. Um, they use it for mainly heating, obviously, and hot water, and the payback was six years. So they paid completely for all the installation in six years and from now on it's costing very, very little to run their heating and hot water. Flagstaff Gardens Bowls Club. That's got a slinky system underneath it. So there's a slinky system under there with nearly five kilometres of um, slinky pipe for heating and cooling of the club rooms. We're now getting serious and this is where you start putting your loops into your piles in the ground. 
This is the Strabag building in uh, headquarters in Vienna. 1.7 megawatts heating, 2 megawatts cooling, and they're used by 220 by 50 meter deep concrete piles. The payback in this was only 3.4 years. And the reason it's such a short period is the holes were already in the ground, you just had to put pipes in them. So it didn't really cost much extra. So a payback in 3.4 years, which means basically your heating and cooling is not quite free because you've still got the electricity to pay for, but it's very, very much cheaper. And this is the one we have in Korea, which is Jungwong University. That's got a total area of 96,000 square meters. It's a very large building. And there's heating and cooling there for 6.23 megawatts, which is quite enormous. Thank you. Thank you.